How are we doing everybody and welcome to Cables Lake up in Oxfordshire. It's one of the embryo angling habitat waters. We're here for the mainline carp project volume three. And I felt a couple of big kicks, probably his tail thrashing and he's now on the move again. Stay back Giz, if you fall in, I'm gonna have to rescue you and try not to laugh. Absolutely buzzing, early into the session to get off the mark already with a cracker like this. I just hope there's a few more in store that look equally as nice. And I tell you, there is nothing more exciting than when you get a big leak coming off of your spot and you know there's fish feeding. You are just looking at your bobbins in anticipation. That is an absolute cracker. Bosh. The wind is, as you can hear, mega, mega strong, blowing an absolute hoolie. That's a big old bow in that. Might have took a few casts, but it's always worth getting them bang on. Yes! <laughs> How are we doing everybody and welcome to Cables Lake up in Oxfordshire. It's one of the embryo angling habitat waters and I'm really excited to have a go because it's a lake that I've seen people catch fish from but I've never actually wet a line here before. It boasts a stock of between 85 and 100 carp and 12 to 15 of those go over 30 pound with the lake record standing at a mega 38 pounds so it would be lovely if we could catch one of them whilst we're here. We're here for the mainline carp project volume three. I've already had a good walk around the lake and I've picked a swim that gives me a great view of not only the section of lake that I'm in but of every bit of water that's there. So if I do need to move at any point to move on to the fish and they do start showing somewhere else I will see that. But before I get around there and get any rods in the water I've got to dip all the kit in the dip tank just to ensure that no disease can be spread from old kit onto a new lake. So uh, wish me luck and I'll see you around at the swim. Right, now I've opted for a swim called the Lookout. It gives me a great view of the whole lake, as the name would suggest. More importantly, I think it controls the middle zone of the lake. The swims opposite me can only fish quite short range, so that whole area out in the middle where I know the fish hold up after listening to the bailiffs, that's all mine. Again, talking of the bailiffs, they've recommended areas in a couple of swims. They fish it week in, week out, so they know the sort of spots to look out for and roughly where they've are. So I've taken their advice. I've had a good lead around out in that area and I like what I find. I found a bit of silt, I found a bit of gravel and there's sort of bits of weed all over as well. So with the help of a little marker lead, with those little nodules on there, when I think I've found a clean spot, I can drag that across and if that's still coming in clean, you know you've got a really, really clear area, perfect for presenting almost whatever type of rig you want to go with. Now, because it's so weedy, and because I don't know the lake very well from um, with, with sort of tactics of how they get caught, I know they like a bit of bait, but rig-wise, that's down to me. So I'll probably start the trip with a couple of different options and uh, ring the changes from there. But until then, until we've got rigs in the water, it's time to give them some food.
Right, I am just about ready. I've got a healthy amount of bait out all on one spot and I'm gonna fish three rigs on top of that. But because I don't know the lake very well, to keep my options open, I'm going with three different rigs. First up is the solid bag. It's one of my favorites when fishing at, at this sort of range over a bit of bait, just having a boosted pile down amongst it all often nicks the first bite. And the other two, I've got a spinner rig with a high attract pop-up on, and I've got one of my favorite booms and loop combi rig with a little cell wafter tipped with a little bit of fake corn. Hopefully, one of them does a bite sooner rather than later. Let's have a go. At the start of any session, it's vitally important to get the fundamentals right. You can then understand if things are working well or not and make any necessary changes. With location sorted, ensuring you use a sharp hook and cast accurately are probably top of the list. Once I was happy that the rods were on the money, I moved on to another important fundamental, having everything ready for a quick recast should I get a bite. Getting a rig back into position quickly after a bite has caught me so many bonus fish in the past that preparing a few bags or rigs as soon as the rods are out is something I now do as a matter of course. So with a few solid bags prepped plus a couple of fresh combi and wafter rigs tied and ready to go, it was time to relax and enjoy some toasted marshmallows with my daughter Emily, who along with the family dog Gizmo had come along for the trip. Day one at Cables Lake was soon drawing to a close. The traps were set, anticipation of a bite was high, the game was well and truly on. Right, well, it's been a pretty uneventful night so far, other than some big winds and lots and lots of rain. It's due to rain pretty much on and off all day. I've just seen something there. I think it might have been a tent show. Um, yeah, we do a lot of rain today and some really big winds. Now, I'm not, um, I'm not too worried at the minute. I did put a big hit of bait out, so I didn't really expect much last night. And whilst it's weird to take confidence from coops diving on you, I've watched them drift over my spot a couple of times and they have been diving down, they have been picking up bait. So I know the carp haven't cleared me out. I'm sure something's had a little feed out there already. Um, but I, I do think it's a matter of time before perhaps they turn up en masse, really start to have a feed on the zone and one of the rods rips off. I'm gonna leave them for now. I'm gonna see out the sort of morning spell. Um, from what I've learned and from what I've been told, the bites that are happening at the minute seem to be coming late afternoon and into darkness. So I'm happy to leave them sitting there now. I'll probably freshen them up around midday, one o'clock, something like that, if nothing's happening, just so that they're absolutely prime and ready to go again when the fish are, are likely to have more of a feed. But as you can hear, it could be a case of battening down the hatches for a little bit. Luckily, I'm just tucked back a little bit and the wind is sort of brushing through this swim. There's a guy tucked right on the end. I think he's in for a stormy old trip. It's early days yet, I'm sure there's bites to come. I told you I weren't expecting much yet. <laughs> Surprising though, it's the middle rod. I always think when I'm fishing over a big hit of bait and I've spotted accurately, I expect the rods on the outside to go first. So this has come plumb in the middle. I think it's on a little, a little cell wafter tipped with a bit of orange corn. That little flash of colour. Flash of colour, extra flavour, whatever it might be, that is what instigates your hook bait getting picked up quicker than everything around it. He's done a big old kite round to my left. And it's always a bit nerve wracking on a new lake because I've got no idea where the weed beds are, if there are any snags that I don't know about. I don't think there is. 
but there's certainly plenty of weed. But he's, he's come in quite nice. If you notice for most of the fight, I've actually kept my rod tip low to the water. I fish my lead to come off and that often helps the fish stay up in the water so you avoid a lot of those weed beds. I've just seen him roll out on the surface so it's sort of doing the job. He's not far away. There he is, it's lovely, playing him in this crystal clear water. I can see a lovely looking common twisting and turning and hopefully, oh, my line flicked off his fin. I could see it caught around his dorsal. He didn't like that. What is it, Giz? What is it, mate? Look, Giz, look, what's that? What's that? Out there. Stay back, Giz, because if you fall in, I'm gonna have to rescue you and try not to laugh. Yes, 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 yes. We're off the mark, is he? <laughs> what is it? Who is it? Look. Look at him. What is it? What is it? You good boy. Well, how about that for a way to get off the mark? 25.10 of literally perfect common. I love, he's got little fins. Look at that little tail. Absolutely buzzing. Early into the session to get off the mark already with a cracker like this. I just hope there's a few more in store that look equally as nice. This one's fell to the wafter rig. So like I said, I had three different rigs out there. I'm not making any changes to anything just yet as it is only the first bite, but if that rod goes again, I'm pretty sure two will be out there at least before we know what's going on. Well, sometimes lady luck smiling. Even though the wind is really hacking in, I wanted to redo all of my rods to get ready for the afternoon bite time. And uh, I reeled in my left rod, then my middle rod, and then the one remaining rod has just pulled up tight and we've got fish number two attached. I'm a little bit gutted I've reeled them in now, I'll be honest, but we've got a blank canvas now. I can get all three rods back out, hopefully get this one in the net. It is going to be tricky in this wind. <laughs> I wonder how many times you do that. You might have fish on your spot and you reel in. Would you have caught if you'd have left them five more minutes? Must have happened loads of times. Well, I don't think this one's very big, but he's almost there. He's a nice scaly one. I can just see me yellow pop up hanging out of his mouth. It's like a lovely linear. Come on, mate. Oh, look at you. You are lush. Oh, yes. <laughs> Thank you, Lady Luck. That is an absolute cracker. I was expecting like a 
a mid double to pop up. But yet again, it's another fish over 20 pound. Bosh. Well, how about that for a cracker? I thought it was a lot smaller. It's actually bigger than the first one. 27 pound of mega linear mirror. Now I'd made a slight decision to change one of the rigs over out there to put another combi rig on with another bottom bait. And I was going to change the spinner rig, but the spinner with the little yellow pop-up has just done this bite. And now that the wind is, as you can hear, mega, mega strong, blowing an absolute hoolie, it will be a nightmare trying to get a solid bag back out to that range. So I'm gonna change the solid bag over. I'm gonna keep with the spinner and get two combi rigs out there now starting to feel like the spot is rocking. God, it's a big old bow in that. Might have took a few casts, but it's always worth getting them bang on. That is close to that middle rod. <laughs> I'm just gonna let all three lines settle a bit pay like an extra six foot off just to let it slacken off a tiny bit and we're in the game. While they're doing that, I'm just gonna try and get three or four more spawn falls of bait out over the top uh, and it's really looking good for more bites. Now we've had a couple, the nerves are gone. We know the fish are visiting the spots. I've got three rigs out there that have essentially all done bites. Confidence is very high. As you can probably see, the wind is still blowing an absolute hooli. We've had it all this afternoon, rain, a bit of sun, but the one thing that's been relentless the whole way throughout is these massive gusts of wind. Thankfully, that second fish came at just the right time because before the real strong gusts got in, I managed to get all three rods back on the spot. They're probably not as tight maybe as I would like them to be because even in that wind, with it being a crosswind moving left to right, it's, it's hard to address the bow in your line and hard to get them as tight as, you'd, as I'd really like when trying to fish them all on one spot. But they're back out there, they're definitely fishing. They're both of the rigs that I've had bites on. So I've got one on a spinner and I've got two on, on combi rigs out there. So I'm happy that should the fish move back in, there's every chance of another bite. I've had to sort of play on the safe side and batten down the hatches a bit. I think if I was here on my own, I'd risk it and just see what the night brings. But having me, having me dog and me little girl with me, I've got to make sure that we're all sort of screwed to the floor should this wind last well into the night. Whatever happens though, it's been the perfect start. We're 24 hours into the session, but you know, give or take. We've got a couple of fish on the bank. And as I put that big hit of bait out at the start, I now know that fish are visiting it quite regularly. I've nicked a couple. I'm sure that other fish will have been in and around that spot the whole time as well. So it does feel like it's a matter of time before we nick another bite. But as I said, due to the wind, I might not be quite as accurate as I would like to be. It takes a few more casts than you'd like. Certainly the baiting was not quite as, as honed in and as accurate as you'd normally like when fishing such a tight spot. But it's, the wind is due to drop through the night. So if nothing happens, or even if, if something does happen in the night, I'm gonna be up at first light. The wind is supposed to be relatively low in comparison come the morning. So I'll be able to get, a, you know, with a, within a few casts, I'll have three rods nice and tight again. I'll stick a little bit of bait out because it doesn't seem to be doing many bites at night. The daytime seems to be when the fish are at their most active. So I want to ensure by getting up early and getting the rods back on the money that when they get on the feed again, everything is set and ready to go. 
I'm pretty confident we're gonna get some more action. And if the size and the stamp of the fish stays as we've been catching, I'll be more than happy with that as well. I'll keep you posted. Well, another quiet night, kind of as expected if I'm honest. The lake's not been doing too many bites at night, plus coupled with the fact I was getting my rods out yesterday in what can only be described as gale force winds meant I could have been marginally short of my spot. But, as I said, I made a point of, I've got up early this morning, I watched the water for a bit. If I'd have seen fish out there, I'd have probably left them. But after a little period of, you know, watching, seeing nothing, I decided to reel them all in, get them all wrapped up, get them all back on the spot, followed by, I think I did eight to 10 spoms of bait as well. I just wanted to make sure there was fresh bait, loads of fresh attraction out in the swim, and I'm glad I did, because as you can see, the wind has picked up again already. Not to the strength it was yesterday, but certainly strong enough to make things a little bit tricky. But I had my bites yesterday from 10 o'clock onwards. Now I feel like I'm in prime position. The rods are 100% bang on. The baiting went to a tee and I honestly think it's a matter of time before we get another chance. Let's hope so anyway. Well, I said I was getting ready for that daytime bite time and it's happened. Bang on nine o'clock, the right hand rod has ripped off. Well, I say ripped off, I was fishing quite tight clutches, but when I picked up, I immediately had to give it a bit of line and it came, went into one weed bed and I've got it out of that, but now it's just gone into another one. But with this, with this wind pushing on, it's really hard to judge how much pressure you're putting on the line. So at the minute, I'm just keeping a tight line to it to see if he kicks his way out. If not, I'll put the rod down for a bit and see if he swims out for us. Now, once a fish goes into weed, it's something I like to do is just to put the rod on the rest and just give it a chance to swim out. You see too many people that put loads of pressure on it, which often leads to a hook pull, or worse still, leads to cutting, your, you know, cutting through your line. There could be anything in that weed. There could be zebra mussels that are really sharp, and by you putting extra tension on your line, could cause it just to be cut through. So be patient, 
keep a relatively tight line to it. And what will happen often is the carp will literally swim its way out. It will take a little bit of line and when you pick it back up, you're in direct contact again. I'm gonna leave that sat there just for a few minutes and then I'll pick it up, put a bit of pressure on it again. And often that can lead to the fish coming back out. It's fingers crossed time a little bit. Okay, that, them little few minutes of work, I just picked it up, put it under a bit more tension, and I felt a couple of big kicks, probably his tail thrashing, and he's now on the move again. But what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna get to the front of the swim, I'm gonna lower my rod to cut down the pressure that the wind is putting on the line, and try and keep the fish up in the water. It's another lovely looking carp, real dark mirror. Oh, come on, mate, you are another lovely looking fish. I want to have my photo with you. Here he comes. No, he doesn't. A little yellow pop up, doing me proud. Just in the scissors. Get in there, mate. Oh. Whenever you have a fish get weeded up and you eventually land it, it always feels like a proper victory. Buzzing with him. Right, let's try and get him under my other rods. Well, there we go, a hat trick of fish and a hat trick of 20 pounders. This one is the result of being patient when it got weeded up but more importantly, it shows the importance of accurate baiting and getting your rigs absolutely spot on. It's come after only two hours of resetting the rods this morning and getting everything ready for that all important bite time. It also proves just how effective we've got the rigs working. So I'm gonna get this one back and we'll have a little run through of exactly what's been doing the bites. Thank you, mate. Mwah. Since the start of the trip, there's been a couple of rigs that have done the bites for me. Now, the first bite came on my Loops and Booms combi rig. So it's quite simple. You've got a stiff section of boom, 25 pound braking strain, and that's connected to a supple section of Supernatural Braid, which is 18 pound braking strain. And you've got, the boom offers you not only the stiffness on the cast to ensure that it stays separated from the main line and prevents tangles, but should a fish pick this up and reject it like we know they do, then it also allows it to reset as well. The hook bait is a wafter with a little bit of fake corn on the top and it's balanced out so that, it, so that should a fish reject it, it's always gonna push away so that it's ready to go again. And more importantly, when you cast it for the first time, it's landing as far away from the lead as possible. Now tying it, it's a little bit tricky, but not once you've done it a few times. I start off with a section of boom, I crimp it both ends, one end, as you can see, has got quite a large loop on, and that's because I like to fish it on a helicopter style system, and I like to be able to quick change it on and off of a quick change swivel, nice and quickly, especially once I've landed a fish. I like to be able to take it off, get a fresh hook bait on, and get another rig out there in the quickest possible time. You then have a smaller loop, crimped in the other end and that's one of the important parts of it and one that you uh, you need to get exactly right. It's a loop of no more than two millimetres in size and the reason it's so small is because it's there to enable you to attach the braided section nice and easily. So to tie the braided section I start with the length of the supernatural braid, I use a size four crank hook which has then just got a very simple knotless knot. I tie my hair loop one end first of all do the knotless knot and you're left with a tag of so long left at the other end. And simply, the way you started the rig by tying an overhand loop for your hair is how you finish the other end. 
You tie a little overhand loop in that, as small as you can get it, and then you have to loop to loop it together. So you take the small, supple section of supernatural braid with the loop on, it pushes through the loop in the boom, and then you pass the hook through the supernatural loop and pull it all tight. Now it sounds a little bit tricky like I said, but honestly, once you've done it a few times, you'll realize just how simple it is. I then use a piece of dark matter putty over the top just to keep it all neat. And again, because I'm casting quite a distance, I'm over 20 wraps out there, 22 and a half in fact, you just want to make sure that there's nothing on the rig that could cause a tangle. So all of the tag ends caused by the crimping and the loop in the braid are all covered up by the putty. Now this is my favourite rig when it comes to presenting a bait on the bottom. Like I say, it's a wafter hook bait, so it's nice and balanced. The middle of the spot where I had the original bite from on this rig was so clean that I wanted to have a bait down on the deck. However, the other side of the spot, the left hand and the right hand side were slightly dirty, maybe, maybe clay, maybe some firm silt. And to ensure that I was presented, I wanted to have a pop-up out there. Rig of choice for that the good old spinner rig. It's a rig that you've probably all used lots of times. It's arguably one of the, the most popular rigs that's out, that's out there at the minute, but that's all for very good reason. It's easy to tie, but more importantly, it's super effective. I honestly believe that when a carp picks this one up, there's not too many times that it gets away with it. Working on the helicopter system exactly the same as the other rig, and with a well-balanced pop-up, it's tangle-free in flight, and as I said, if a carp does get away with it, it's always gonna reset itself nicely. Now, interestingly, I've had three bites and this has actually done two of them. As it stands, I've only got one rig on this presentation and I've got two out there on the loops and boom combi. Now, regardless of what happens with the next bite, I think if the next bite was to be on one of the combi rigs, then I'll keep everything as is. But if I do get another bite on the spinner, then I'm pretty sure I'll be having two of them out there and one of the combi. We'll just see how the session progresses. I've got to be honest and say, it's been a pretty disappointing day. I had a bite this morning within two hours of resetting the rods and thought, you know, I didn't think I'd get a bite every two hours, but I certainly thought I was going to get another chance. They were absolutely bang on the money, bait bang on top of it after getting the fish, but it just hasn't happened. I've not seen a great deal either. I've seen nothing up over my spot to make me think the fish have even been feeding there. So maybe they are just coming around that same sort of time every morning and that's when the bite spot is out on that zone. Now, a couple of things have happened though and you can probably see out of the corner here that I've got three rigs that all now look exactly the same with the same hook baits and there is a very good reason for that. I've had three bites since I've been here and the last two have come on little yellow pop-ups on a spinner rig. Now, I mentioned to the guy who's fishing down to my right, he'd not had a bite for over 24 hours, so I told him that my last two bites had come on yellow. He's put a yellow pop-up out back on his spot that he'd been fishing, and within a couple of hours, he's had a 30-pounder fishing that method. Now, I'm all about looking for those trends, um, those consistent things that are happening to keep the bites coming, and the fact that the last three bites on the whole lake have been on yellow, it feels right that going into the last probably 24 hours of the session, to put all my eggs in one basket because that seems to be the most productive thing. Now I have made one other change as well. Because I'm only getting one bite at a time out there, I've decided to just fish two out on the main spot tonight, but there is another reason behind that. I've seen four fish in total show in the whole time I've been here, and two of them have actually been round to my right, still in my water, so after seeing the second one show, they've shown at about the same sort of time, around about midday, one the first day, one the second day, today. I've had a good lead around, and do you know what? There's loads of weed. I've bought in lots and lots of Canadian off of the marker lead, but all of a sudden I just got that different drop, a proper donk down. So I, I, I clipped it up, I've had a few casts to investigate, and sure enough, I've found um, not a massive spot, and it's made up of, uh, similar to the spot out there, I've got a bit of gravel, but largely I've got some nice, firm, smooth what I think is silt or possibly clay 
and I'm pretty sure that's exactly where those fish have been showing. So I've got 10 spawns out on that spot. I've let it have a little bit of time to rest. Hopefully a couple of fish will move in. And then what I'm gonna do, where the wind has almost dropped entirely, I'm gonna ensure that I get my free hook baits exactly where I want them to be. There's no room for error now. We're going into the last 24 hours. Then I'm gonna put a few more spawns out onto the main spot. Something may well happen tonight, but if it doesn't, it's definitely in the morning between nine and 10 o'clock, seems to be a consistent bite time so far. And I know that everything is gonna be set and ready to go. Let's have a go, shall we? Now, bait choice for this trip has kind of been made easy by the rules. At this time of year, on embryo waters, you can only use pellet and boilie. Now, rather than literally just putting pellet and boilie out there, I like to do my own little thing to give it its own, its own personality, if you like, to make it stand out from what other people might be doing. So to start with, I use two different flavors of boilie. I use um, one of my all-time favorites, I can still remember the first time I used Activate. Me and my mate had been carp fishing for not very long at all. We worked in a tackle shop, so we'd literally grab a, a packet of shelf life boilies at the end of a day on a Saturday, go fishing for the night. And we, you know, we'd, we'd catch our fair share. We'd catch three or four fish each. My mate then took me fishing to the same lake. He was a far more experienced carp angler and he bought this, it was a bag of bait, and I'll never forget it, it was in a red and silver foil bag, and it was mainline Activate. Now, I didn't think much of it, he told me it was fresher because it used much fresher ingredients, unlike a shelf life, and it could essentially go mouldy, it was that fresh, it had real fresh ingredients in it, it uses eggs, so it can't just be put on a shelf. And that day we went, he had 18 fish, which at the time, I mean, I wouldn't have put that down to the bait alone because he was a far better angler than me, but I had nine fish and I'd never ever had that many in a 24 hour session, let alone just popping down there for the day. So you could say I was converted back then onto fresh boilies. And you know, like I say, the Activate is, is an all time classic, but one that I still use a bit in my fishing. But I've, I've got to say using it this trip and having that fresh smell coming out at me, it's made me want to use it quite a lot more. But enough about me reminiscing. Um, what I then do, so rather than just put 15 mil boilies in there, I like to put a load through the cutter, so I've got some half baits out there as well. And as they keep going back through the cutter, the same bits and pieces, you start to get quarters, thirds, sixths, if you like. You've got loads of chops of different sizes. And I then run a good few handfuls through a crusher as well, because those little tiny particles will get caught up in the water with the liquids that I add in that I'll tell you about in a minute they get dragged up through the column as well and it just makes the whole area far more attractive I do exactly the same as that with the cell too because it's if you like that's the modern classic that's the fish uh, sorry that's the bait I've probably caught more carp on than any other boilie I've ever used I've used it for a lot of years um, and it, it just seems to get better and better I don't know what it is it's an incredible catcher of carp and that's exactly the same a load of chop a load of crumb and then finally the matching response pellets to go with it. So I've got some activate response pellets, some cell response pellets, but again, I'm not just leaving it there. I like to personalize it. And by adding a couple of different liquids into the mix, you can do exactly that. So you've got your own unique food signals out there. So the first one I put in is quite a lot of the new smart liquid. And for this trip, I'm using the fishy flavoured one. So I like to put a drizzle over the top of the whole bait, mix it all up, then a little bit more because some of them bits at the bottom, they just won't be getting a nice covering. And that is like a fatty food source. That is working up and down the water column. It's making the whole area around your bait cloudy, including the water column as well. And no matter what height the fish are swimming at, I truly believe they get a taste, they get a smell of that. And 
whilst they might not all do it, some of them are definitely going to drop down to investigate. And then finally, um, probably a liquid I've used, probably been using it for 10 years, and that is hemp oil. Now, whilst it's attractive in its own right, letting off food signals all over the place, what I really like it for is that once some of that oil gets sort of soaks into the bait and it sells underneath some of the bait on the bottom, when a fish does come in and root around and nudge it about, you get these little flat spots come up over your spot so you know that fish are investigating. And I tell you, there is nothing more exciting than when you get a big leak coming off of your spot because you could, like we've got today, like you can see now where I'm baiting up, when you've sat there for a couple of hours behind your bait and you get this flat spot coming off and you know there's fish feeding, you are just looking at your bobbins in anticipation. Now I've got three more of these to go out. The rods are then all perfectly set for the night ahead. And let's just hope with 24 hours to go, ish, we can nick one or two more bites. Well, yet again, it's been another quiet night. And just as I sat here, the plan was just to leave the rods out. They were well set last night, a bit of bait over the top, and I was just gonna wait for that morning bite time. Unfortunately, our white feathered friends had other ideas. There's one resident swan on here, and every morning, another couple land, and he makes it his sole duty in life to scare them off. And that's what he did. But unfortunately, at one point, he scared them through both of my rods out on the main spot and completely wiped them out. I was annoyed at first because it meant recasting. Like, I wanted to keep minimal disturbance, but in hindsight, it literally took two casts to get two absolutely fresh hook baits back out onto the zone. I then put three spoms of bait out over the top. So now I'm actually sitting here. We're still a couple of hours away from bite time, but I've got fresh rigs, fresh hook baits, a little bit more attraction in the swim. So they might have actually done me a favor. Just fingers crossed that they do turn up at the same time they have as the last couple of mornings. We'll see. Oh, literally right at the death of the session. And I was thinking it was just gonna be a lonely walk back to the car park. Oh, it still might be. But the right hand rod, where I saw those fish show and I tried a different spot, I've just had a real slow take on it. I knew the area was weedy. Here we go, he's kicked his way out. I knew the area was weedy and sure enough, he's found the weed bed, but hopefully it'll go the same as it all went yesterday. Come on, mate, come on. This would literally be a perfect ending. Exactly the same as yesterday. I'm just holding on to it. I've given him a loose clutch and he's taking a little bit of line. Come on. Stick 
get back on the rest for a bit. Hope and pray we can get him out. Just saw him tip twitch a bit. Well, he's still on there. Absolute stale, mate, unfortunately. I think the fish is still on. The line definitely moved just a second ago, but um, he's well bedded down. Back on the rest, and then uh, get one of the bailiffs on the phone and perhaps see if we can go out in the boat for him. <sighs> Pray for good or cold. I think he's already gone. Fish has probably been on for 45 minutes. I've not seen the line move for a long time. My gut says it's already come off, but I've got the boat, I've got my life jacket, I've got a landing net with me just in case. Keep everything crossed for me, eh? Yes! Yes! Well, look at him. It might have turned out to be the smallest one of the trip at just under 19 pound, but I tell you what, after a boat battle, after him weeded me up, he might be smallest, but it feels like the biggest result. I am chuffed to be leaving when I thought, I thought the chances of a bite today had gone, but it just goes to show the importance and the, and the value of keeping your eyes peeled and keep watching the water. This one has come because I've seen a fish show sort of over my left shoulder, if you like. I've seen him a couple of times in that zone and it made me investigate the area. I found a spot yesterday evening and this is the result. A bait in the right position has led to his downfall. It has been a thoroughly enjoyable session on cables and whilst it might be my first trip, I can tell you now, it won't be my last. What a way to end. <laughs>